Greetings and welcome to Maxims of Law, Part 5. Today we're going to be going over some more of the Maxims of Law from where we left off last time, so let's get right down to it. If uh, there's people in here, all right, I see some people in the chat. Unfortunately, this thing isn't showing here. Now let me get it going. There we go. All right. There he is. Brought it down. Mr. 420, thank you very much all for showing up. And let's get the show started here. So we're going over the maxims of law. Let's zoom in here. Okay, so it fills the screen nicely for everyone. And we're going to get right down to it. I might as well get to our page first here. All right. So we're just going to get through here. We went over corruption yesterday, crime, and customs, debtors and creditors, and I believe this is where we left off was, uh, no, we had a fraud, we did fraud. Fraud is not purged by circuitry, which was a nice one there going in circles, deeds and writing, and uh, describe, define, discern, and this is, I believe, where we left off. If not, it's a good place to start from here. All right, we got some more people here, just in time, great, and let's do it. All right, there we get the full icon, looks like. Yes, sir. Describe, define, discern. False description does not injure or vitiate, provided the thing or person intended has once been sufficiently described. Mere false description does not make an instrument inoperative. So the false description does not injure. Provide the thing the person intended has once been sufficiently described. Interesting here, and this looks pretty uh, complex. And of course, as we go down here, we'll find different ways of expounding on these concepts, which would usually clarify ones that maybe aren't so clear at first. So let's continue. Uh, by the way, before we continue any further, just want to remind everyone we do have uh, Black's Law 9th edition that we'll have at our disposal here for uh, any words that we might be unaware of and make sure we leave uh, no word behind. And as you can see here, we're on the ninth edition of Black's Law. All right, let's get back to it. He who describes and distinguishes teaches well. Every definition in law is perilous, for it is on the verge of being subverted. Now that is quite deep there. Every definition in law is perilous, for it is on the verge of being subverted. And that means every definition is in danger of being uh, used for unintended purposes, being subverted. A false description does not vitiate. Whatever is added to the description of a thing already sufficiently described is of no effect. The undefined is to discern through law what is just. Discretion is to discern through law what is just. Interesting there. To define is to determine with precision or to exhibit clearly the boundaries thereof. So to define is to determine with precision or to clearly exhibit boundaries. So clearly defined boundaries or clearly exhibited boundaries and uh, precise definitions. The purpose of a description is to afford the means to identify the subject matter 
That's the purpose of a description. A description which distinguishes it from any other, although a better or still more certain description might be given, is all that is required. As long as you have the distinguishing features, a better or more certain one will not be required, just one that can distinguish it from another. And of course, the purpose of that description or that distinction in that description would be for the subject matter. 30, 31i is a very important one, I think, there because uh, the purpose here, we're, we're talking about the purpose of a description. And it's, it affords, right? So it gives us the means to identify subject matter. So what are we talking about? Well, we need to describe what is the purpose of the description so we can identify the subject matter at hand. Let's continue. Ah, we're on to doubt and doubtful. And before we go to this, I just want to remind everyone this is not to be uh, uh, construed as legal, lawful information, not to be used for your professional, personal life at all, and don't do this at home. All right, let's continue. Educational entertainment purposes only. Doubt, doubtful. See also ambiguity or certainty. In doubtful cases, the more worthy or favorable are to be taken. In doubtful cases, there is no presumption in favor of the will. Now that's a... Uh, takes a little bit of thought in here. In doubtful cases... There is no presumption in favor of the will. Okay. So when there's doubt, we can't favor of the will because uh, someone's doing something for a particular reason can't overshadow the doubt. Inquire into doubtful points if you wish to understand the law well. Because by reasoning, we arrive at legal reason. Inquire into doubtful points if you wish to understand the law well. Beautiful words. Because by reasoning, we arrive at legal reason. In a doubtful case, that is the construction of the law which the words indicate. So when things are in doubt, then we look closely at uh, the words indicated within the construction of law. So if it's constructed around particular laws, then it's the construction of that law to remove the doubt. In a doubtful matter, the negative is to be understood or regarded rather than the affirmative. Interesting ways to look at things such as doubt. In doubt, the gentler or safer course is to be followed. So when someone doubts whether they should redact a record or not, if there's no harm in giving you it unredacted, but there could be harm in withholding uh, a public record, the safer course should be followed by uh, giving benefit of doubt to the people. When you doubt about a thing, do not do it. <laughs> Well, that's a good one to end on. Now we get to dower. See also inheritance in marriage. <laughs> the law favors dower. It is the reward of chastity. Therefore, let it be preserved. Okay, we need to go over dower through uh, Black's Law because uh, clearly this is more of an archaic term today. So let's get down to it. Bear with me as we go through this terribly scanned document that I can't search easily. It seems it's just quicker to scroll through it and hope for the best. And it's a real slow scroll, too, because of the live stream here. And I go on and on. But it is a, just a scanned image document here with an overlay that doesn't search well. All right. Almost there. Come on. Disastrous. Almost there. Come on, don't 
control, domain, dominium, TOS attack. This is definitely ninth edition. Uh, almost there. Dow, Dower. Here we go. 14th century. <laughs> At common law, a wife's right upon her husband's death to a life estate in one-third of the land that he owned in fee. With few exceptions, the wife could not be deprived of a dower by any transfer made by her husband during his lifetime. Although most states have abolished dower, many states retaining the concept have expanded the wife's share to a life estate in all the land that her husband owned in fee, also termed dowment, meritagium, curtsy, see curtsy, nice, along with her paraphernalia. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We'll be going on about dowries, but we'll just leave it at that one. All right. Well, that was a nice little uh, digression there. Let's get back to the book. Oops. Uh, all right. There we go. Dower. So the law favors dower. It is the reward of chastity. Therefore, let it be preserved. Where there is no marriage, there is no dower. A legitimate dower belongs to every woman of all lands and tenements of which her husband possessed in his own right as of fee, etc. A woman leaving her husband of her own accord and committing adultery loses her dower unless her husband takes her back of his own accord. <laughs> Jeez. In law, a dower is a provision for a widow. Upon her husband's death, out of his hands or tenements for her support and the nurture of her children. Dower ought not to be sought from dower. Right. Let's move along here. Duty. Um, yeah, I, I get it. And that's where uh, I think a lot of uh, in uh, non-Western nations uh, have have a little more towards the dower there, embedded into their culture and customs. Duty of individuals. Oh, this is a good one. It is safe not to obey him who has no right. It is safe not to obey him who has no right. A man may obey the law and yet be neither, neither honest nor a good neighbor. <laughs> Interesting there. I think that gets back to one of the other maxims we had uh, earlier. He who becomes a soldier of Christ has ceased to become a soldier of the world, nor is he entitled to any reward who acknowledges no duty. Those who do not preserve the law of the land, they justly incur the awesome and indelible brand of infamy. Hear that? Those who do not preserve, preserve, not pervert, preserve the law of the land. Oh, well, those who do not preserve are perverting. They justly incur the awesome and indelible brand of infamy. That which touches or concerns all ought to be supported by all. He who betrays his country is like the insane sailor who bores a hole in the ship that car which carries him. Yeah, this is a great one here. Again, we're talking about duty of individuals. Of individuals. He who betrays his country is like the insane sailor who bores a hole in the ship which carries him. No one is bound to do what is impossible 
and that's from Black 2nd Edition. A neglected duty often works as much against the interest as a duty wrongfully performed. So malfe uh, nonfeasance and malfeasance. They uh, work as much against the interests. Right and obligation are considered by all ethical writers as correlative terms. All right, we're on to economics in busyness. See also buying and selling property. All right, this should be uh, a little more sobering now. Commerce ought to be common and ought to be converted into a monopoly and the private gain of a few. Let everyone employ himself in what he knows. An insane person who knows not what he does cannot make a bargain nor transact in any business. So an insane person who knows not what he does cannot make a bargain nor transact any business. Whatever money is paid is paid according to the direction or intention of the payer. Whatever money is received is received according to that of the recipient. Money is just the medium and measure of commutable things. For by the medium of money, a convenient and just estimation of all things is made. See, money is just a medium and measure, a medium and measure of commutable things, things that can be moved. You're moving property, you're moving things like that, but it's a medium and measure of what you can move. For by the medium of money, a convenient and just estimation of all things is made. Money is agreed that everyone values money, so whatever you make, you can value it according to uh, a measure of money, and then you can use that measure of money to purchase or buy whatever you want or need. Of course, things like gold and silver have usually been the agreed upon convenient estimation of, of all things, but nowadays uh, there's different types of instruments that are used for that that can be sometimes considered questionable as to their value. It is said to be monopoly when one person alone buys up the whole of one kind of commodity, fixing a price at his own pleasure. All right, we got matrix transparency present. Just in time. It's always a good time because this is YouTube, so there's always the replay later. But step on in and let's continue. Goods are worth as much as they can be sold for. This is great for pricing. <laughs> Goods are worth as much as they can be sold for, which is actually how commodities are set. The term merchandise belongs to movable things only. So merchandise would not be uh, land. Merchandise is whatever can be sold. A workman for hire promises the skill of his art. He engages to do the work in a skillful or workmanlike manner. So that's a promise. When a workman for hire promises the skill of his art. Cause and origin is the material of business. So cause and origin is the material of business. All right, we got uh, Mr. Delete Laws. Audit them. If you're listening, you're, uh, you're excused from class. There's a, uh, uh, someone wants to see you in the office. <laughs> Those things, which rarely happen, are not to be taken into account in the transaction of business without sufficient reason. So things which rarely happen are not to be taken into account. The superfluous distractions 
and nonsense without sufficient reason. They're not to be taken into account in the transaction of busyness. The words current money designate current at the time of payment. A sacred thing does not admit of valuation. Yes, sir, delete laws. Good to see you, too. It is inequitable to permit some to trade and to prohibit others. Ah, this is interesting here. It is inequitable to permit some to trade and to prohibit others. And let's be clear, they say trade, not commerce. Four, concerning anything which occurs without deceit or wrong on the part of the vendor, the vendor is secure. No deceit or wrong on the part of the vendor, the vendor is secure. He at, he at whose risk a thing is done should receive the profits arising from it. So risks deserve the profits. The value of a thing is estimated according to its worth in money, but the value of money is not estimated by reference to a thing. So the value of money is not estimated by reference to a thing. So value of money needs to be set by agreement, right? Everyone agrees on the value of money. Then the money becomes a medium of measure so that we can move trade. Usury is odious in law. We know that. Usury debt is forbidden. Services, which are incapable of division, are to be performed in whole by each individual. So division here, right? Uh, we have spoke of division before and dividing the whole. So services which are incapable of division, indivisible, right? are to be performed in whole by each individual. So if it's a service which is indivisible, then it has to be done by an individual in whole, the service. You can't divide that service amongst several individuals. Otherwise, that would be considered a divisible service. Interesting concept here. It is natural that he who bears the charge of a thing should receive the profits and that's back at he whose risk a thing is done should receive the profits arising from it at 35Q. No one is prohibited from following several kinds of busyness or several arts. And uh, yeah, this is the Greek way. Should definitely be doing more than one thing. Multiple income streams is always good too, when possible. Money, pecunia, is also called from cattle, Picus, because all the wealth of our ancestors considered consisted in cattle, which was the original money's uh, you know gold land and cattle, right? What one has paid, knowing it not to be due, with the intention of recovering it back, he cannot recover back. This was back before we read a similar maxim to this. Let's read this one again. And this comes in, uh, I think, a lot of people when they're uh, talking about... Oh, Lord. Uh, let's see here. Ah, oh, Officer Murphy. Great. Great to see you here. Officer Murphy. Welcome. Yeah, the contract... Yeah, uh, quality workmanship fashion is... Uh, yeah. And that's uh, just to clarify one of these maxims, and they'll do it in the contract, it's just as an element of full disclosure, right? That you're clearly defining yourself as a marks, uh, work uh, craftsman by stating the promise of good workmanship. So, again, I'm going to say what one has paid, knowing it is not due, with the intention of recovering it back, he cannot recover back. Oh, Alan, I appreciate that. I'm very glad that uh, you found it, and uh, please subscribe and hit that bell notification. I'll try to keep uh, content going out consistently. All right, let's get on to equity.
and civil practices. Since we've been talking about equitable, we'll get to this, 36. A court of equity ought to do justice completely and not by halves. All right, thank you, Delete Laws. And as you know, I, I, I uh, always uh, try to keep it so that we don't cross streams here so I can uh, share audience as much as possible for those that are willing to take a little deeper dive into some of these things like legal maxims and American jurisprudence. Oh, yeah, yeah, please hit that like button. <laughs> this is a, a good place for them uh, to come so we can learn this stuff a little bit deeper. And I try to also align this with the, the common concepts that you're going over there to keep it customary for us to stay on uh, on top of this and and I, I think the more people that are actually become you know uh, uh, intelligent in their practice of law just as regular people of, of this place is, is going to make it so that they can uh, ensure the government is being held accountable for what they're supposed to be doing well what's left of it so at least we'll be able to hold them to what their duties are and the equity in civil practices. Let's continue. A court of equity ought to do justice completely and not by halves. He who prefers a charge against another, however just it may be, will himself be unjust unless the accused be heard in his own defense. Equity acts upon the person person, not man, it says person. Equity acts upon the person. Equity does not make law, but assists law. Equity is the correction of that wherein the law, by reason of its generality, is deficient. Absolutely, that's uh, what we're reading right there is equity restores the whole. The correction of that wherein the law by reason of its generality is deficient. So that'd be one. Uh... Well, definitely. Yeah. Um, I'll reach out. Uh, after this, we'll figure a way. In the court of chancery equity, a man shall not be prejudiced by his mispleading or defect of form, but according to the truth of the matter. For the decision should be made according to conscience and not according to the rigor of law. This is where courts of equity are becoming extinct because even in name of court of chancery, you'll see sometimes, and good luck finding a court of equity anywhere here, um, they're usually merged into civil court for some reason, and they blur the venues in such a way where I, I get the feeling that the, the courts of equity are becoming uh, less and less prevalent now. Yeah, no, no uh, Zuck book for me. I'm not on any social media, so that's not going to be a good place. But we'll, uh, we'll, we'll figure a way. Uh, okay, let's continue here. Nothing is more unjust than to extend equity too far. Hmm. The civil law is what a people establishes for itself. Now that's the civil law is what a people establish for itself. Law regards equity. Equity is a certain perfect reason, which interprets and amends the written law, comprehended in no writing, but consisting in right reason alone. Uh, I think you mean 1939, right? Unless you're from the future. <laughs> All right, let's continue here. So law regards equity is a great one to remember there. Equity, as 
Equity is, as it were, equality. Equity is a species of equality or equalization. So equity is a species of equality. Interesting. So this is how the, uh, the hierarchy of the etymology would go, right? The Court of Chancery is the workshop of justice. Another beautiful one right there. The Court of Chancery is the workshop of justice. In all things, but especially in law, equity is to be regarded. In all things, but especially in law, equity is to be regarded. Equity looks upon that as done, which ought to be done. Equity never counteracts the laws. And that's from Blacks. Equity suffers not a wrong without a remedy. So, yeah, I've seen this too in uh, Equity suffers not a wrong without a remedy. What species? Interesting, yeah, because there's legal tender species too, isn't there? I'm going to look into this a little bit more. I appreciate that one there. Let's see, where do we leave off here? He who is placed out of the law is civilly dead. Wow, that's an interesting one there. Equity follows the law. Equity follows the law, but then equity never counteracts the laws. There's another one here. Law regards equity. Okay, so 36I, law regards equity. And then 36R, equity follows the law. <laughs> so this is, uh, you see how these weave together a, a more comprehensive picture. Laws derived from the pure source of equity and justice must be founded on the consent of those whose obedience they require. We spoke of consent, maxims involving consent earlier. So we're talking about laws derived from the pure source of equity and justice must be founded on the consent of those whose obedience they require. So uh, they shall have no tax except those that are under the consent of the people. So laws derived from the pure source of equity and justice must be founded on the consent of those whose obedience they require. So let's think about that one. We're on to error and mistake. See also fault fiction. Error, artfully disguised or colored, is, in many instances, more probable than naked truth. And frequently, Error overwhelms truth by its show of reason. Wow. Error of law injures. A mistake of the law has an injurious effect. That is, the party committing it must suffer the consequences. You hear this? 37b. Error of law injures. A mistake of the law has an injurious effect. That is, the party committing it must suffer the consequences. I guess it goes back to Roman law, huh? Every consent removes error. Consent always removes the effect of error. An error which is not resisted or opposed is approved and that's back to consent it is safer to err on the gentler side or the side of mercy false in one thing false in every thing 
Hear that? False in one thing, false in everything. An error made by a clerk should not injure or prejudice. Ooh, a clerical error may be corrected. Now that's a tight one there. So, uh, an error made by a clerk should not injure or prejudice. A clerical error may be corrected. So remember this, people. The people is the greatest master of error. A man is presumed to be simple-minded who makes a mistake in his own name. A man is presumed to be simple-minded who makes a mistake in his own name. That can go pretty deep. A man, I'm oh, sorry, uh, to refer errors to their sources is to refute them. The denial of a conclusion is error in law. The mistakes of the writer ought not to harm. Error dwells in general expressions. The multitude of those who err is no protection or excuse for error. So just because many people err is no protection or excuse for making your errors. Um, one of my favorites here is this one here. Uh, false in one thing, false in everything. Once a liar, always a liar. Once a fraud, always a fraud. And the other good one here was, uh, let's see here. Yeah, that was uh, the best one there. For sure. All right, we're on to event. An event is that which follows from cause and is called an event because it eventuates from cause. So an event is an eventuality from the cause. A new matter always produces various events. Ah, matter. Like a new subject matter always produces various events. An event is vainly expected from which no effect follows. And that's from Black, second edition. The progress of events shows many things which, at the beginning, could not be guarded against or foreseen. So the progress of events shows many things which, at the beginning, could not be guarded against or foreseen. Interesting, yes, yes. Yeah, it's kind of time-consuming, but when you look at the nonsense wasted time by not knowing the law, I think there's far more time wasted and a lot more valuable time we'd have on our hands if we didn't have to deal with the absurdities of those that don't follow the law. Evidence, proof, and witnesses. Okay, this is extremely important for everyone, so this is where we're going to be leaving off for tonight. I think this is going to be the most important one yet, so let's continue. Things done in one action cannot be taken as evidence in another, unless it, it, it be between the same parties. So let's break this down. Things in one action cannot be taken as evidence in another unless it be between the same party. So you can't say he did this to that guy and that was proven true. So he did that to me. It doesn't work like that. But if he did that to you before and he does it again, then that could be used as evidence as a pattern or, or a discrimination or something of that sort. A confession made in court is of greater effect than any proof. Wow. 
No one ought to be a witness in his own cause. No person is understood to be a competent witness in his own cause. Hmm. Proof is the effect of evidence. You hear this? Proof. Proof is the effect of evidence. The establishment of a fact by evidence. You get this? So proof is the establishment of a fact by evidence. And what is evidence? In criminal cases, the proofs should be cleaner than the light. Wow. Nothing can be treated as evidence which is not introduced as such. The law arises out of the fact. What is clearly apparent need not be proved. The law does not require that to be proved which is apparent to the court. That which appears to the court needs not the aid of witnesses. So, uh, that which appears to the court, so appearances, need not the aid of witnesses. Ah. It is in the nature of things that a negative is no proof. It is in the nature of things that a negative is no proof. He who affirms must prove. So, for the affirmations, we need proof. There's no proof in negatives. The answer of one witness shall not be heard at all. The testimony of a single witness shall not be admitted under any circumstances for civil cases. Witnesses cannot testify to a negative. They must testify to an affirmative. You hear this? The burden of proof lies on him who asserts the fact, not on him who denies it. As, from the nature of things, he who denies a fact cannot produce any proof. For goodness sakes, people, if anything else you leave with is, please remember this, 139N, the burden of proof lies on him who asserts the fact, not on him who denies it. The burden of proof is not on the person that denies the assertion. And that's as from the nature of things, he who denies a fact cannot produce any proof. So this is pretty plain and simple that seems like it just does not get through to most people that the proof lies in he who asserts the fact. There's no proof for someone that denies a fact. The proof, the burden of proof, is on the one that asserts the facts. What is proved by record ought not to be denied. A witness alleging contrary or contradictory things, whose statements contradict each other, is not to be heard. Things manifest and plain truths do not require proof. Proofs ought to be evident, to wit, clear, and easily understood. You hear that? Proofs ought to be evident, to wit, clear, and easily understood. The extremes being proved, intermediate things are presumed. Get that? The extremes being proved. The intermediate things are presumed. All things are presumed against a despoiler or wrongdoer. A leading maxim in the law of evidence. All things are presumed against a despoiler or wrongdoer. You get that? So if it's a wrongdoer, all things are presumed against. Presumed. But remember... Only the intermediate things are presumed, the extremes being proved. You prove he's a wrongdoer, the intermediates are still 
presumed. It is vain to prove that which, if proved, would not aid the matter in question. <laughs> that cannot be proved which proved is irrelevant. Yeah, that was a, a great one. That's something that people need to be very clear on because it's an easy way to get tricked. All things are presumed to be lawfully done and duly performed until the contrary is proved. That goes both ways, doesn't it? One eyewitness is of more weight than ten ear witnesses, or those who speak from hearsay. Wow, yes, indeed. Witnesses are weighed, not counted. That is, the more worthy or credible are to be believed. Ah, oh, you weigh evidence, you don't count it. You're weigh witnesses. That's interesting. Principles prove. They are not proved. Fundamental principles require no proof. Or, in Lord Coke's words, they ought to be approved because they cannot be proved. So, principles. What is not proved and what does not exist are the same. It is not a defect of the law, but of proof. And that's from Blacks. Like they say, a document that does, if there's no documentation of an event, then the event didn't occur if it's to be documented. Simple as that. So, what is not proved and what does not exist are not the same. Oh, I'm sorry, it's a. Uh, I lost it there. No, anyways. Uh, let's see here. Hearsay, thanks. That's where we left off. <laughs> All right, so let's... Uh, yeah, okay, so what, what, what is not proved and what does not exist are the same. It is not a defect of law, but of proof. That's the one. Okay. Any person skilled in his particular art or profession is to be believed. That's back to the workman, right? Workmanship. When he speaks of matters connected with such art. Credence should be given to one skilled in his per peculiar profession. When the proofs of facts are present, what need is there of words? Wow. Report which induces suspicion, ought to arise from good and grave men, not indeed from malevolent and malicious men, but from cautious and credible persons, not only once, but frequently. For clamor diminishes and defamation manifests. And that's from Black, second edition. Let's, let's read this again, because this applies to a lot of people that are auditors, and I think that there's some really good auditors that take this to heart, and others that haven't figured it out yet. Report, which includes suspicion, ought to arise. So when you're making a report, or you're, sus you're suspecting that there's some kind of uh, nonfeasance, malfeasance going on, it ought to arise from good and grave men. Seriousness, right? not from malevolent and malicious men, but from cautious and credible persons. And not only once, but frequently, right? What you do sometimes or how you do anything is how you do everything. So not only once, but frequently. For clamor diminishes and defamation manifests. So every time you have clamor, it diminishes, right? Uh, the credibility and the defamation now manifests. The important thing is to keep the high road so when there is clamor that it doesn't diminish the auditor. It will diminish those that are causing the clamor and to be always taking that high road so that you know you always appear good and grave, serious, not malevolent or malicious. So it's important to be cautious and credible whenever we're suspecting anyone of wrongdoing in making a report of such. It should be from good and grave men. Let's continue. The power of proofs or the right of offering proof or giving testimony 
is not to be narrowed. A witness is a person who is present at and observes a transaction. Evidence does not consist of vague, uncertain, irrelevant matter not carrying the quality of proof to induce conviction. Judicial notice is a form of evidence. The rules of evidence are of great importance and cannot be departed without endangering private as well as public rights. No one alleging his own turpitude or who wishes to perish is to be heard as a witness. <laughs> okay. Well, that makes sense there, and I think that's a good one to uh, end our session on. Next time, we're going to take up on exception. That's exception, errors, and such, so we're going to expound further on that, which is going to be great. So, again, I appreciate everyone showing up tonight and exploring these maxims of law along with me. I hope that you all gain some valuable knowledge and understanding and, and, and general uh, a feel for what the law is supposed to do for us and how we should be involved in the things that matter to us and to the people around us and to the land that we, we inhabit along with uh, the rest of our civilization here. These are the things that keep peace and allow us to find peaceful resolution and solutions, I should say, to all the different events that might uh, eventually uh, occur due to people's different types of behaviors as there is a uh, variability uh let's see what we get here yeah by putting one on judicial notice to say you have exculpatory evidence of the same in your possession yep yeah so these are yeah where you could get down into a lot of procedural things which is one of the recommendations here is to learn your laws of uh general uh i'm sorry the rules of evidence for your state courts right and that's usually where most people are, are doing things. You could also learn rules of evidence for federal court if that might be a venue you're going to be involved in. But I would think just if we're on a particular state, it would behoove us to learn those rules of evidence and procedure for your particular state. It just allows you to have a better understanding of how things are to be done and prevents a lot of abuses, I believe, from happening to people that are just uh, not aware of the possibility of the way justice can go awry when we're not vigilant. And that is our duty here, as we spoke of some of the maxims earlier, is that there's, there's more of a duty not just to our public servants, but to the people to ensure the government is serving the public interest. So at that, let me see, federal rules of evidence. No, I'm not doing federal stuff. Uh, thanks anyway, though. We got other people that do that, though. There's plenty of YouTube channels that handle it. I like to focus on things of the, the foundations of our country's American jurisprudence, and, you know, the, the distinctions of law. And that's pretty much where I like to stick around. There's a lot of other ones that focus on legal issues and codes and such. And that's also good for certain specifics. But I believe the foundational principles of our American style of common law is to be preserved. And the only way we can do that is by not just learning it, by acting it out in our daily lives. So with that, I would like to say a uh, uh, salute to you all for showing up, and I hope you will continue with me on this journey. Please make sure you do subscribe and hit that bell notification so we can uh, keep that algorithm happy, and I'll be here to continue on. Again, I thank you all for being here, and I'll see you on the next one. Salute.